Good evening, everyone. Sorry to keep you waiting for a few minutes. Thank you so much for joining us for the Faculty of Public Affairs current lecture. My name is Andre Plod. I'm the Dean of the Faculty of Public Affairs. As we begin, I would like to acknowledge that Carleton University sits on the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin Ash Anishinaabe people. My job this evening was supposed to be to introduce the president. Since this is throwback, the president is off at another event. He came to join us earlier, so we kind of had whether I should do a pantomime or something. <laughs> and I will not let you suffer through that. But instead, I'll have the pleasant task of introducing uh, my colleague, Barry Wright, who is the director of the Arthur Kruger College of Public Affairs and an associate dean in the faculty. He is the one who organized tonight's event. So Barry, please take over. Thank you, Dean Plourd. It is my great pleasure to introduce Greg Ipp, our distinguished 2017 FPA current speaker, a graduate of economics and journalism here at Carleton, and one of our 75 notable alumni celebrated this evening in honor of Carleton's 75th anniversary. The Currents Lecture is one of the highlights of the year for the Faculty of Public Affairs. It was initiated in 2012 with the completion of Rich Craft Hall, this building we're in now, evocative of the building's situation, beautiful location on the Rideau River, and of the faculty's engagement with the many currents in public affairs. The lecture series focuses on themes at the intersection of current public affairs in the fields of policy, politics, and journalism, and it seeks to provide a forum for distinguished leaders in these fields. These matters, of course, are at the heart of the constituent departments and schools within the Faculty of Public Affairs. They are also at the heart of Gregory Ipp's impressive contributions to public engagement and debate about global and U.S. economic developments and policy. Greg is the chief economics commentator for the Wall Street Journal. He returned to the journal after six, a six-year stint as a U.S. economics editor for The Economist. He began his journalism career right here at Carleton as editor of The Charlatan in 1987-88. After graduating, he was at the Vancouver Sun, the Financial Post, the Globe and Mail, and then joined the Wall Street Journal in 1996. He appears regularly on radio and television, including PBS, National Public Radio, NBC, the BBC, and I understand that just today, he was on CBC Radio and CBC Television's Power and Politics. He is author of The Little Book of Economics, How the Economy Works in the Real World, published by Wiley in 2010, and Foolproof, Why Safety Can Be Dangerous, and I better get this right, and How Danger Can Make Us Safe, published by Little Brown in 2015. Named one of the best books of that year by the London Financial Times. And I teased Greg that I take the weekend FT rather than the Wall Street Journal as my sort of leisure reading on the weekend. Uh, very high praise indeed. Greg is recipient of numerous awards, including a Pulitzer Prize shared with journal staff for breaking articles in September 2001, and shared awards from the Scripps Howard Foundation in 2008 and the National Press Club in 2016. In 2005, he received the Business Journalist of the Year Award from the World Leadership Forum. It is indeed a great pleasure to bring Greg and other distinguished graduates back to Carleton for this evening's FPA Currents Lecture. Please join me in welcoming Greg Ipp to the stage for his lecture. Thank you, Barry, for that very nice introduction. And it is truly an honor and a pleasure to be with you tonight. Um, teaching the first class of Economics 1000. Hope you're all ready. You've done the prepared reading and everything. It's just joking. Sorry, sorry. So uh, I've only been back to Carleton a few times since I graduated. Um, yesterday, I went to the, I was at, doing an event at the Economics uh, Alumni event at the Unis Center. And as I left to uh, get my cab uh, back to my place, uh, I got completely lost. I mean, this place did not look at all like the Unis Center I spent so much time in, like, you know, 30 years ago. I mean, the, the colors were all different. You know, there were structures here, nothing there that, like, uh, you know, the restaurants had changed their names and so on. 
And then so, and I started like worry that I wouldn't actually be able to find my Uber car. And then I saw it, a long pulsating sweaty line of kids lined up and loud music and a roar, Oliver's. And I knew exactly where I was. I said, yes, thank you, the world is as it should be. <laughs> um, and it brings back memories, because 30 years ago, I spent a lot of time in this building, uh, sorry, in the Unit Center 30 years ago, when I was editor of the Charlton, 1987-88. There's a lot of things that I'm very thankful to Carlton for. They gave me a degree in economics and journalism that, against all odds, I still use on a daily basis in a job that I love. Uh, I met friends that I still have that I met my, that I still have at uh, Carlton. They are among my dearest, closest friends. I met my future wife at Carlton. I had the most fun of my life running the Charlton in 1987-88. It was something about being in the thick of things, of events that year that I just I've never really been able to reproduce it since. I just had so much love then, and it's 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 one of the things in journalism and public policy that's kind of not reproducible, that uh, to actually have a say and to be in the middle of events. Now these were like small campus size events. You know, we're talking about scandals involving like football games and so on. But you know, uh, still for us it was kind of a big deal. Now at around the same time, the entire country was going through its own massive public policy debate, perhaps the largest of my lifetime. It had to do with a free trade agreement that the Mulroney government had negotiated with the United States. And John Turner uh, trying to basically um, you know, resurrect his political career as leader of the liberal opposition had made it the mission of his life to stop that agreement. And so we at the, sh I actually, by the time the election had started, I had stepped down, but I wrote a big article about the free trade agreement for the charlatan. And I actually tried to bring a little bit of my own economics training to the question and uh, on this question. And later an economics professor said, uh, when I picked up the charlatan and I said, oh my god, they're going to opine on free trade. <laughs> this can't be good. He actually said, well, you actually did an OK job. And I was, I was, I was pleased about that. But I will say that was, it was an interesting debate because uh, there were, it was an existential de debate for Canada. It was really an issue of like, will the country that we have defined, tried to define separately from other countries in its own special way disappear, subsumed into the great American uh, melting pot morass as a result of this agreement. And uh, it almost seems funny now to think about that, that those were the kinds of questions people were asking. Because here we are 30 years later, and Canada in some ways is more distinct than ever. But I will say, I did not expect 30 years ago that the free trade agreement would still be in the headlines <laughs> when I came back. After all, it sort of had become part of the furniture. You know, uh, Canadians and Mexicans, after they joined, had come to take uh, free trade for granted. Maybe most Americans did by this point, too. But there was one person who never did take free trade for granted. That was Donald Trump. Now, he was a businessman at the time, an entrepreneur, a showman. But he hated NAFTA. He hated free trade in all its forms. He hated trade with Japan. He hated trade with Korea when, we, when the United States did an agreement with Korea. And he hated it, most of all, when the United States made it easier to trade with China. By the time he ran for president last year, he had tr transformed this opposition to free trade into something much bigger, a populist assault on, uh, uh, on all things global, not just trade, but immigration, both legal and uh, illegal, on, on big banks, on the World Trade Organization. Shortly after he won the election, he basically shamed a manufacturer called Carrier, which makes uh, heating and uh, ventilation equipment, into canceling plans to outsource jobs to Mexico. He went to Indianapolis and had one of his gigantic, gigantic iconic rallies. And he declared, there is no global anthem, no global currency, no certificate of global citizenship. We pledge allegiance to one flag. And that flag is the American flag. From now on, it's going to be America first. Now, it was probably unintentional, but the phrase America first does evoke some dark moments in American history. It was the name of a movement in 1940 that was dedicated to keeping the United States out of the Second World War. Well, here we are, it's eight months into the Trump presidency, and we're still trying to get a fix on precisely what America first means. Now, if you follow US news nowadays, and like right nowadays, who cannot follow US news? It's kind of like addictive in the worst possible way. But you're probably aware that they have their own version of Game of Thrones going on in the White House right now. <laughs> it's just like on a nonstop like battle between the nationalists and the globalists with everything except the blood. And I'm not even sure we're going to get through the next four years without the blood as well. One day, the nationalists have the upper hand. The next day, it's the globalists. One day, the US will tear up the Korea Free Trade Agreement. Oh, wait a minute. The next day, those plans are on hold. Trump announces that illegal immigrants who arrived as children, the so-called dreamers, will be deportable. A week later, he's actually working a, a deal with 
the other party, the Democrats, to actually let them stay. So I do not know how this is going to end. So two things I want to uh, sort of make clear at the beginning. First of all, I don't know how it will end. Whether this flirtation with nationalism by Donald Trump of America firstism will turn out to be a sideshow in, in American history or whether it will be a turning point. But I will argue tonight that Trump is a manifestation of a deeper and broader nationalist revolt around the world and against established elite opinion, which happens to encompass a lot of people in this room and a lot of people that I work with and talk to for my job. It challenges many of the foundational beliefs of the global open system that many of us have taken for granted over the last 70 years. The second thing I want to explain is that it's not, not my purpose now to have a polemic that's either for or against these movements, but to try and explain them and to put them in some context, where it came from, uh, how in some sense the mistakes actually of the existing order, of the global, existing global order actually fed to the rise of nationalism today. And I'll reflect a little bit on what it means for Canada. Why has Canada so far sidestepped these, these uh, currents? And why you should not assume that it always will. Now the term globalization is probably one you're all familiar with. It's probably taught in class here, isn't it, Barry? Okay, uh, and it is, you know, very simply put, the uh, process by which goods, capital, and people move ever more freely across, across borders. It's kind of a sort of a, uh, you know, a clinical term, doesn't carry any particular overtones. But the term globalism is probably one you're a little less familiar with, perhaps may not have heard until tonight. And this I would call the mindset, the belief system, that globalization is natural and good, and that global governance should expand as national sovereignty contracts and borders fall. A lot of globalists, as I would call them, don't think it's an ideology because they happen to share it with people on the other side of the traditional left-right divide. Uh, people like David Cameron and Tony Blair or Bill Clinton and George W. Bush. But in fact, globalism and nationalism are in some sense a new political paradigm, other side, opposite sides of a new political paradigm, much as liberalism and conservatism have been for a very long time. In its simplest manifestation, this, this divide is about free trade versus protectionism. That's probably how you think about the current argument over NAFTA. But it's also much bigger than that. It's a battle between what I would say sort of like, you know, priorities of patriotism and community values and, and, and closed and uh, 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 close-knit societies, even illiberal societies on the one hand, versus transnational, borderless, globalized societies and open cosmopolitan values on the other. By which way of saying is that the globalist nationalist mindset doesn't fit easily into our old liberal left right paradigm, but it nonetheless does explain a whole coherent set of values. It may have sort of like burst onto our awareness first when Britain last summer voted to uh, leave the European Union. I mean, it was a historic event. It's the first time really in modern history that a, that a country, a major country, has chosen voluntarily to leave a major free, true, free trade grouping. It was the first movement backwards in institutional globalization. And the reasons went much beyond just trade. For a lot of Britons it, uh, who voted leave, it was about, quote, getting our country back. It was about ending uncontrolled immigration. It was about little England thumbing its nose at the city of London's rootless global elites. As Theresa May, who is now the Prime Minister of Britain, said shortly after the vote, quote, if you believe you are a citizen of the world, <laughs> you're a citizen of nowhere. And that kind of captured sort of the sentiment of the Leave people. The next chapter, of course, was last fall when Donald Trump stunned the conventional wisdom by becoming the uh, president on this resolutely anti-globalist platform. Um, it threw overboard the Republican establishment's uh, uh, longtime support for free trade and its recent embrace of immigration. And he declared free trade, immigrants, and Islamic extremists to be the major threats to American well being. And that was enough for him to win the Republican nomination and ultimately the presidency. But even if that's how we, most of us, first learned about the upsurge in nationalism, it actually began some years earlier, but outside the Anglo Saxon world. In fact, I'd say perhaps the first. Major event was in 2010 with the election of Viktor Orban as Prime Minister of Hungary. Orban's mission was to resurrect the role of the nation state as a defender of its people's interests, not the traditional institutions of democracy. He called this illiberal democracy, an expression that seems freighted with irony and survives today as kind of a neat little catchphrase for one stream of this thought. Uh, Poland later basically followed in Hungary's footsteps and, elect, and elected a government of, uh, led by the Law and Justice 
party, and they, they followed a similar sort of set of values. Um, in the emerging world, uh, the election of Narendra uh, Modi in India, whose party, the uh, uh, Bharatiya Janata Party, is basically a Hindu nationalist party, even though India is ostensibly a secular state. And in 2012, Xi Jinping became president of China. And he began to basically um, intertwine an expansion of the Communist Party's grip on all aspects of society with renewed American, uh, Chinese nationalism. The whole uh, Amer Chinese dream basically could be summarized in, in, in our language as make China great again. And that has basically been the platform by which uh, China has not just limited political freedom at home, but asserted a more aggressive uh, and antagonistic role abroad. Is this a big deal? Well, you know, every country has its patriotic jingoistic impulses, even Canada, uh, except the surge at times of war and the Olympics. Yes, I confess that I got a little bit worked up during the gold medal game in, at the Vancouver Games. I sort of, so I, I, uh, but this is different. Today's nationalism is a revolt against an economic order that has been expanding since 1945. It's against globalization. It's against its institutions like the World Trade Organization, NAFTA, the European Union, even NATO, and against its elites against Davos man, as Samuel Huntington once called him, and against elite opinion, which of course includes the people that I spend my life interviewing and being around, economists and journalists. Now, let me give you a little bit of history about the expression and the nature of nationalism. Now, it tends to evoke dark images of the 1930s, but for most of the last four, uh, three centuries, or four centuries, the idea that nationalism is bad would have struck most statesmen as absurd. Um, in fact, the modern nation state can be traced to the uh, 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 1648 and the Peace of Westphalia, when France, essentially at that point, a Catholic country, decided that it would for the first time put its national interest ahead of its um, religious interest and decided with Germany's Protestant uh, princes in the Thirty Years' War to contain the power of the Catholic Holy Roman Empire. And um, I like to boast to my editor that when I wrote that in a column, it was the first time in 10 years that we had gotten the piece of Westphalia into the pages of the Wall Street Journal. <laughs> Sometime in the next year, I'm going to make sure I get the Holy Roman Empire in as well. <laughs> but in any case, the, uh, the next um, three centuries, the nation state was essentially the dominant way in which societies interacted with each other. Now, interestingly enough, the, the discipline in philosophy of economics was in some sense a intellectual revolt or an intellectual uh, uh, answer to nationalism, an alternative world. To be precise, the very first economists, at the time they were called political economists because economics was in some sense, was a, was a branch of moral philosophy. But people like David Hume and Adam Smith were searching for an organizing principle for society which did not require deference to a higher external political or religious authority. And they came up with the ideas of self-interest and the famous uh, invisible hand of the market. As Adam Smith and wrote in The Wealth of Nations, commerce and manufacturers gradually have introduced order and good government, and with them the liberty and security of individuals who had before lived in an almost continual state of war with their neighbors and servile dependency upon their superiors. Free trade to the early economists was not just an efficient way to uh, allocate resources. It was a pacifying and stabilizing influence on, on human beings. David Ricardo, uh, who here has studied economics, Okay, who here has heard of David Ricardo? Okay, you probably heard of things like Ricardian equivalents. Maybe, you know, your Professor Plourd forced you to study comparative advantage and actually work out the advantages and so on. But I would recommend to you that if that you might want to actually go back, this is the 200th anniversary of that book, by the way. It's one of the most important books in all of uh, the history of economics because the ideas in it are difficult for non economists, but they're wonderfully intuitive and elegant to economists. But what economists may forget about Ricardo is that, like these other political economists of the day, he saw economics as a way to make hum all of humanity better. And he thought free trade was something that would bring the world together. He wrote, free trade binds together by one common tie of interest and intercourse, the universal society of nations throughout the civilized world. Pretty heady stuff. Well, this vision of globalization is essentially what the route that the world decided to take after the Second World War. And it was entrenched in organizations such as the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, which later became the WTO, and the International Monetary Fund. But it was most perfectly consummated in Europe with the creation and expansion of what became the European Union and its free, four freedoms, goods, services, capital, people. And as its founding charter set out, the uh, ultimate goal was political union. 
As conceived then, it was a political, not just an economic project. And EU expansion often followed geopolitical and not economic priorities. The expansion southward in the 80s to Portugal, Spain, and Greece was essentially a way to like, persuade those countries to leave military dictatorship behind and not lurch into communism. The expansion in the 1990s and 2000s into Eastern Europe was a way to prevent those countries from slipping back into Russia's orbit. And similar tensions and priorities uh, took place in the United States. When Bill Clinton decided to go ahead and finish the work of George H.W. Bush and sign NAFTA into law, it wasn't an economic decision. It was about stabilizing the Mexican government and turning this neighbor of theirs, which had always been this troublesome hotbed of anti-American rabble-rousing, into a stable pro-American ally. And in 2000, when Clinton signed the agreement that allowed China to join the WTO, once again, he had visions that this, uh, that exposed to free markets, China would see the uh, value of freedom of expression as well, and that China would become more like us. Didn't really work out that way. Um, you know, Mexico has been stable, but it's, uh, you know, uh, the flow of illegal immigrants continues to come into the United, uh, continues to come into the United States. Uh, China did become wealthy, but it did not become friendlier. It became um, more, did not become more democratic. And it pursued a nakedly mercantilist uh, brand of uh, export promotion that led to massive trade surpluses in the United States and the loss of millions of factory jobs of, uh, in parts of the country we now think of as Trump country. So what gave rise to the transition from globalism to nationalism? Well, as I've been trying to explain, to a certain extent, it was a backlash against the overreach of globalism. Economists, when they approach this question, they tend to see it as purely a response to economic hardship. You know, the US mortgage crisis, European debt crisis, decades of inequality, stagnant median incomes. Something to this, I just saw a recent paper from the Brookings Institution, which does find a correlation between higher unemployment and the rise of populist parties of the left and right. But the tie between um, pocketbook concerns and the rise of the nationalist right is, is not consistent and probably weaker than you uh, realize. For example, as I've noted, uh, the countries where the nationalists have been strongest so in Europe, Poland, and Hungary, did not actually not experience the Euro crisis because they're not members of the Euro. Their economies have done quite well in terms of employment. The only Western European country where anti, an anti-immigrant right-wing party is actually part of the governing coalition is Norway, which is actually not a part of the Euro and whose economy has done quite well. Germany's economy has done extremely well, and yet the anti-Euro um, alternative for Deutschland party grew up um, in revolt to that. And then when there was this large refugee uh, inflow, it saw its popularity shoot up. Britain, too, Br Britain's economy has actually done really reasonably well. It's yet the only country to vote to leave the European Union. And when you actually look at um, studies of why Brits voted the way they did, you know, they, they divide the country into 380 voting districts, and they run correlations, and they find the correlation between unemployment and uh, or wage growth and how they voted is actually quite weak. It's almost non-existent. But there is a pretty strong correlation between the rise in the immigrant share of that district's population and whether it voted leave. There are countless studies of why people voted for Trump. And, and they don't yield a single answer, probably because there are multiple reasons why people voted for Trump. But I think it's clear that Trump voters were not solely and possibly not even mostly motivated by economic concerns. Trump became the nominee of the Re Republican Party by striking, if you just a little bit of history, after 2012, the Republican leadership decided that it was a mistake to be so like hostile towards uh, in their rhetoric and policy posture towards immigrants, and they said to you know remake the Republican Party and invite immigrants into it. We've got to change that. So most of the candidates for the Republican Party in uh, nomination in 2016 bought into that, but Trump did not, and it was Trump who, using his harsh rhetoric about you know Mexican rapists and his Muslim ban, which that won the primary. Just to throw a few statistics at you uh, from our, uh, the Wall Street Journal's NBC poll, um, if you look at people who voted for Trump, 59% believe that immigration makes the country weaker. Among people who didn't vote for Trump, 59% believe immigration makes the United States stronger. 50% of Trump voters said immigration was a factor in their vote. Only 24% of non-Trump voters said the same thing. In the primaries, in every state that had a caucus or primary exit poll, um, among voters who always said immigration was the um, most important issue to them, Trump won all those voters. And there's other things going on than just immigration. I mean, I haven't studied this carefully, but it's been a very tumultuous time in the United States and society. I mean, um, 
demographic change is, is really become quite relentless. You know, the foreign born population in the United States has reached an all time high. Gay marriage has gone from a fringe cause to the law of the land. Social media has upended how we communicate and relate to each other. There's the opioid epidemic. It's in fact the last period I could think of that's comparable is the 1960s when we had you know, the spread of television, the assassination of Kennedy, campus protests, civil rights, uh, riots, the whole bit. What was interesting is that the 60s was a period of rapid income growth. And yet in spite of that, all these social fissures made it a very politically unsettling time. Now, there is a te tendency of, uh, among people at times of insecurity and upheaval to retreat or at least um, you know, long for the familiar. And so nationalists typically will cater to this longing. They'll invoke nostalgia for a simpler time when cultural values and mores were more stable and predictable. And when deployed in the pursuit of power, it is a short step to xenophobia, the fomenting of fear and the mistrust of outsiders, of others in the pursuit of political support. It's been the case certainly in Hungary and Poland, for example, to a certain extent in China. We see elements of it in Britain and the United States. Um, I don't want to miss, uh, anybody here in, uh, making the mistake of saying that just because you voted for a particular candidate, that therefore makes you a xenophobe or not a xenophobe. So this story will get a little bit more nuanced as we go along, but bear with me. Um, Trump certainly, of course, would deny that he was campaigning against outsiders. Um, but it's hard to escape the um, conclusion that the themes he, he, he uh, revisited and the images that he tended to arouse did, uh, consciously or not, draw the support of people who are xenophobic. And early action by his administration continued to uh, play to these themes, such as banning visitors from Muslim countries. Um, and on trade, of course, uh, withdrawing from the Trans-Pacific Partnership immediately. He, would, he has invoked common populist themes, you know, as other populist uh, leaders have in the past, uh, portraying, for example, the people in my profession, the media, as enemies of the people, um, things like statistics as phony or just plain wrong. So you see certain elements in Trump that are sort of uh, uh, at least uh, common with what you see in nationalist populist movements around the world and through time. Um, Staying with the survey research has also found a strong non-economic foundation for nationalism. Uh, for example, two scholars uh, have studied the political manifestos of political parties in 13 Western European countries since the 1950s and found that around the 1980s, you notice this big shift from uh, economic uh, concerns such as wages and income security to non-economic concerns such as culture, national security, crime, abortion, immigration. Resistance to immigration is often blamed on economic concerns. You know, they're a burden on welfare, they'll compete with the native born for jobs. And for this reason, many advocates of more immigration try to respond with evidence that shows that immigrants, even low skilled immigrants, are in fact not a burden on the welfare state and they do not reduce the wages of the native born. And the solution they say is, you know, more training and income transfers for those displaced by the forces of free trade and globalization. Well, I agree with that, in so, you know, as far as it stands, that those are correct and true policy directions to take to address identifiable problems. But there's a deep body of survey evidence that suggests that while economic concerns do drive some of the resistance to immigration, they are not the only or even the main driver. Rather, it's concerns about the impact of immigrants on the rest of the country, on the local community, on changes to the predominant uh, language, customs, or culture. This may relate, relate to ethnicity and skin color, but not necessarily and not, ne not even mostly. For example, there was one study in the United States that was trying to find the origins and the way people respond to immigrants. And interestingly, it found that when Americans were exposed to uh, immigrants of different uh, characteristics, they became much more receptive and friendly to immigrants when they speak English, even when they speak it with an accent. And at that point, skin color ceased to be a relevant determinant in how they responded. This was seen by the authors of the study as evidence that when immigrants appear to have assimilated or are trying to assimilate, it breaks down some of the uh, barriers in the host population. I'm not sure if it's broadly applicable to everything, but I think it was an interesting finding. Now, Canada shares, of course, a lot of sort of, you know, characteristics with the United States. We, we were, for a long time, uh, historically a white country, a, a European country, has experienced very high levels of uh, uh, non-white and non-European immigration. And so that the demographic picture has changed significantly in the last 40 or 50 years. Uh, and in the last few decades, there has been in Canada, like the United States, a slowing in the growth of living standards. So why hasn't Canada seen the eruption of nationalist sentiment and the backlash that you've seen in uh, the United States? You know, last, uh, as the United States elects this 
nationalist right of center president, Canada elects a globalist left of center prime minister. Well, of course, there are factors that are specific to both countries having nothing to do with these broader themes. You know, just like the sort of throw the bums out time for a change factor must surely have played a role in electoral outcomes. But I do think it's true that Canada has done some things differently that really do matter. Economically, Canada has experienced some of the same loss of factory jobs and stagnation of middle class wages that the United States has, but it hasn't suffered as sharp an increase in inequality. The safety net here is more secure. You know, healthcare, for example. I mean, and you lose your job in the United States, the first thing you worry about is that you'll lose your healthcare as well. That doesn't happen here. Uh, there has been more attention by both parties to ensuring that the tax system does not aggravate inequality. But on the non-economic front, the difference in immigration systems is absolutely crucial. In the US, surveys find that across the political spectrum, on the left and the right, when people are asked, to, uh, asked about immigration, there's very broad support for, immigrants, uh, uh, for legal versus illegal immigration, for those who have skills in education who meet specific economic needs of the countries, and who, who either speak English or try to speak English or commit to speaking English. And I think this fact alone um, can explain the differences between the United States and Canada on immigration. Because Canada, of course, has an immigration system that does all those things. You know, for years, for decades now, Canada has had a system that prioritizes all those things. As my friend Tony Keller at the Globe and the editorial page editor of the Globe and Mail likes to put it, the US has low levels of legal and high levels of illegal immigration, and Canada is exactly the reverse. Canada gets to choose its immigrants, while in the United States, it's the opposite. And this is, I think, the key reason why immigration is less um, divisive in Canada. It is simply uh, immigrants are more easily assimilated, and it seems like more of part of the social contract in Canada. And part of this is a luck geography. It's Canada is a hard country for an illegal immigrant to come to. <laughs> you know, I mean, if Canada had a long border with a uh, underdeveloped country, I suspect we would have more of an illegal immigration problem than, than it does. There's another important difference, and that has to do with the choices and the priorities of the political uh, leadership. In the United States, immigration wasn't always so politicized. Uh, Ronald Reagan was, uh, did sign into law the last major legalization, or amnesty as some call it, of illegals back in the 1980s. And Democrats weren't always crazy about Im uh, immigrants coming in. After all, they were seen as a threat to the unionized workers who were for a long time the base of the Democratic votes, the Democratic vote. But in recent decades, immigration has become Excuse me. Uh, highly partisan, a highly partisan issue. Republicans have become ever more dependent on white working class voters who feel the greatest economic and cultural anxiety about immigration. Democrats have become much more reliant on minority voters, which makes it much harder for Democratic politicians to propose tough responses to the issue of illegal immigration. Uh, their opposition, for example, to Trump's wall is kind of ironic. I mean, as a practical difference, there really isn't much you know, uh, difference in efficacy between a wall and a fence with a lot of, you know, drones and sensors and so forth. And back in 2006, many prominent Democrats voted in favor of exactly that, a high-tech fence, 700 miles of fencing. One of the Democrats who voted for that, a young senator named Barack Obama. In Canada, the, the immigrant vote was traditionally the liberal vote. And then the Conservative Party made a concerted effort to break the liberal stranglehold on the immigrant vote, especially in Ontario. In the US, as I was mentioned, the Republicans tried to go in the same direction, but their grassroots supporters rebelled, and as a result, they nominated Trump. Well, what lies ahead? Will Canada continue to resist the nationalist tug that the United States and other countries like Britain have felt? Uh, the Conservative Party seems to have gone a little bit in that direction. You know, there was the uh, um, uh, effort to prohibit the wearing of the niqab during citizenship ceremonies. Uh, the discussion of a uh, hotline to report barbaric foreign practices. And although I'm not an expert on the political um, situation in Canada, I am told by those who are that this may have been a factor that hurt the uh, conservatives politically in the 2015 election. And then there are those, and so there are the people who say, well, this doesn't, doesn't this prove that this Canadians are immune to appeals to, uh, uh, of this sort of divisive nature? Maybe. I think it's too soon to tell personally. But I am a little bit careful about jumping to that conclusion. First of all, I would not have predicted 10 years ago that the United States would have gone in this direction. If you look at other countries that we, that Canada sort of like feels a kind of like bond of uh, similarity to that uh, have a similar centrist liberal policies and uh, historic openness to foreigners like Sweden or Germany, 
um, they saw surges in right-wing nationalist parties in the wake of large influxes of refugees. Canada right now is experiencing a little bit of a test of its own with the surge in Central American and Haitian uh, refugees from the United States in recent months. And in Quebec, you do see elements of the uh, political class, uh, you know, seeing whether this is something that can be exploited from a, a political point of view. So that said, it's hard not to escape the uh, uh, perception that things are not working out the way the nationalists thought uh, 10 months ago. You know, earlier this year, the nationalist wave looked unstoppable. You know, you know, there was going to be a row of dominoes in Western Europe fell. But instead, first Austria, and then Netherlands, and most important, France, uh, <coughs> defeated the nationalist parties. In France, uh, a neophyte globalist, Emmanuel Macron, defeated a seasoned nationalist, Marine Le Pen. You know, what's interesting to me is that Le Pen was actually right when she called the euro the source of a lot of France's economic problems. Um, but what was interesting to me is that the French voters didn't want to lose the euro, and so that turned out to be a loser issue for her. Meanwhile, the nationalists in Britain and the US are looking like the dog who caught the car. <laughs> they have achieved what they want at the, uh, at the polls, electorally, but they're struggling to actually figure out how to govern, how to put those beliefs into a, you know, a coherent way of doing business now that they control the, uh, the, the mechanisms and machinery of government. Britain will get its sovereignty back, but there's growing worry about the economic impact on that country. A very you know, strong sense that they want their cake to, and they want to eat it too. They want all the economic advantages of the, what they used to have with Europe, but they don't want to, uh, the um, unpleasantness of the freedom of movement. The Trump administration struggles to govern in great part because Trump himself has no, appears to have no consistent vision of what he wants to achieve or who his allies are. Um, and he has found that you know, the sinews of globalism are a lot harder to sever than he kind of thought. It's, it's a lot harder in you know, running the apparatus of the federal government than saying you're fired on television. Who'd have, <laughs> who'd have thunk it? And take NAFTA. Now, uh, in the run-up to the election, I, uh, I wrote pieces, and others did as well, worrying that, or warning that the uh, tr trade is the one area of American governance where the president is endowed with extraordinary powers. He can basically, like, uh, slap tariffs on countries, withdraw from free trade agreements, you know, uh, impose quotas, do all sorts of things without any permission whatsoever from uh, Congress. And I was, you know, thought it was a realistic possibility that within months the United States would be out of NAFTA, that there would be like uh, tariffs shooting up. And I suspect that Trump and many of his people thought the same thing. What we discovered is that when he attempted to do that, is that the United States, one of the saving graces of the United States, and I've said this actually the last time I came to Carlton, is that the United States loves competition. And so it's not just in things like, you know, like uh, you know, business and sports, but they like competing power centers. In the United States, what we have seen is that there's competition not just between the executive branch of the White House, but between the chambers of Congress, between uh, the governors, between business as a group, and all of these brought to say, hey, wait a minute. We don't want NAFTA to go away. And so all these competing center powers of center basically united to try and demonstrate to Trump that this was not a wise move. Um, the same is true you know, of the Korea Free Trade Agreement. I mean, like literally, like I think two weeks ago, it was leaked to the media that they were going to like, pull out of the Korea Free Trade Agreement like that week. And then, whoa, you know, Kim Jong-un like, launched a missile and detonated an H-bomb. And suddenly, that was put on the back burner. So, uh, in, um, so I think basically um, what we're discovering is that uh, what Trump is discovering, as any economist would have told him, that tariffs and you know, protection, that economics is a world of trade-offs. And you put down tariffs or you pull out a free trade agreement, and bad stuff is going to happen. Um, the hard reality is that attacking globalism and globalization has been a potent vote getter and like uh, apparently a very nice kind of uh, th theme to build a movement around. But it's not a constructive platform for running a country. Once you tear up our trade th uh, treaties, what do you replace them with? When international commerce is more integrated with our lives, not just imports, but digital content, uh, people we interact with, you know, putting up borders of any kind creates enormous unintended consequences. If your population is aging and your fertility rate is low, as is true for virtually every country in the uh, Western world, then how do you grow your economy unless you let in more immigrants? Now, at some point, the nationalists are going to figure out what it's taken two, you know, economists have been saying for 200 years. A more global open economy does make 
all of us richer. Now, before we succumb to hubris again, and me personally <laughs> uh, as well, um, let's, let's take a step back. Does this mean the nationalist movement is really over? No, not by long shot, not in my opinion. Never, you know, I, as Mark Twain, I think, said, never forecast, especially about the future. And I've discovered that my political forecasting is the only thing worse than my economic forecasting. My economic <laughs> forecasting is pretty darn bad. Well, but let me point out a few things. First of all, yes, the nationalists lost in France, but Marine Le Pen won a third of the vote. That's more than twice what her father won 15 years earlier. And in the first round, she won more than any other party, including the mainline Socialist Party and Republican Party. I would still say a national front government is a matter of when, not if, in France. In the US, it's dangerous to assume anything about Trump <laughs> based on one week's headlines. Uh, his you know, uh, negative attitude towards immigration retains a very strong base in the Republican Party, and Trump remains more popular with Republican voters than congressional uh, Republican leaders. There's been a lot of turnover in his administration, that Game of Thrones thing I was saying, but the people who have stayed include all the people on the trade team. You know, Wilbur Ross, the Commerce Secretary, Robert Lighthizer, the Trade Ambassador, Peter Navarro, his trade economist, they're all, they're all still there. They're all very negative on free trade. And most important, Trump is still there, and he's very negative on trade. And meanwhile, the people that we have come to think of as the globalists, like Gary Cohn, the head of the National Economic Council, their light seems to have dimmed. And more important, even if you sort of like just sort of like step aside and from all the specifics to Trump and his administration and go to the economic and non-economic demographic forces that I'm talking about that essentially fuel this nationalist wave, they're all still there. Because Trump clearly draws unusual degrees of support from uh, uh, xenophobes and white supremacists, there is in some corners a knee-jerk tendency to therefore say Trump supporters are all xenophobes and white supremacists. That's factually uh, incorrect, and it's counterproductive. Many of the people who voted for Trump are in fact pro-immigration. They just want those immigrants to line up, take their turn, bring skills, and speak English. They want secure borders so that like Canada, they get to choose who immigrates to their country. Now, one of the reasons why they voted for Trump isn't because they especially liked Trump or the way they talked or in their hearts actually agreed with a lot of things they said, but they didn't feel that what they wanted they were going to get from the Democratic Party. And I read a very interesting interview with Jeffrey Sachs. Jeffrey Sachs is what they call a rock star in economics. And he's also one of the, uh, he's at Columbia University uh, he's also a uh, liberal and a democratic of impeccable credentials. But he had some pretty tough words to say for his party and other liberals in this interview about immigration. He said, well, let's talk about this wall that the Democrats have decided they're never going to cooperate with. It sounds so vulgar. It's like building the Berlin Wall. But to half the country, he says, it made sense. Don't countries have borders? Don't you police borders? And then he said, but the left doesn't have a language that acknowledges the need for borders and the need to police them. Um, Sachs, Jeffrey Sachs notes that if Western countries open their borders, he thinks, and, and this is actually based on some estimates I've seen, if Western countries dropped their borders and allowed uh, uh, immigration tomorrow, one billion people would migrate, would immigrate. As he says, no society would tolerate even a fraction of that flow. He says, <clears throat> any politician who says, let's be generous without saying, we're not going to throw the doors wide open, is going to lose politically. So he says, so I'm, again, I'm quoting Jeffrey Sachs, that's where the left is tongue-tied because it sounds chauvinistic to say we need a limit on migration. But you know what? This is actually starting to, to uh, sink in. I mean, there was a very interesting interview with Barack Obama shortly after the election. And he was asked, what was the takeaway for Democrats about uh, this vote? And the point is, one of the things he said was, we Democrats have to uh, realize that for a lot of folks, borders do matter. So where, do we, where does this leave us? The nationalists, you know, uh, things seem so heady for them like eight months ago. They're now confronting the contradictions and flaws of their own platform. And the globalists, people like Justin Trudeau here in Canada, Emmanuel Macron in France, say you have the wind at their backs. But I think all globalists, including them, have to be wary of the message that voters have sent in the last year. I think it's interesting, and, I, and I've, I've watched this from afar with more than a little casual interest, how Trudeau has balanced these um, pressures. And it was good that when he allowed, um, he brought in the Syrian refugees, he did it in a very highly disciplined 
organized way. I, I think that is very, very key to this. Because once again, a sense of control over these arrivals is so important to maintaining public support for them. And with respect to the problem now developing along the Quebec border, he, he, you know, he, he and his government made it clear that, no, sorry, this is happening outside the standard channels. You guys will have to go back. Canada did not just say open doors to everybody. Macron, I mean, I followed him pretty closely as well. He, uh, he's actually adopted some of the language and views of the nationalists. You know, he basically wanted to stop a foreign takeover of a French company by an Italian company, no less. They're a close neighbor in the European Union. What, you know? I thought you were our friends. He wants Eastern Europeans who come and work in France to pay French payroll taxes, okay, so that they're not getting a false advantage over French workers. This, does this, is this a betrayal? Is this a co-option? Maybe it is, but I, could, I think of it more constructively. I think it, uh, I think these positions by people like Trudeau and Macron is recognizing that when globalism overreaches, they lose the support of the people. And that is what opens the door to people who offer more simplistic you know, and more inflammatory solutions. Canada can learn, I think, from some of the things the United States has been through. But I know that the US sure as heck could learn a lot from what Canada has got right. And that's it for those are my comments. Thank you, Greg, for uh... Uh, a timely, thoughtful, accessible, and thought-provoking talk. Uh, we have about 20 minutes for uh, questions and discussion. Uh, as a courtesy to our guests uh, and to the other audience members, I would ask you, if at all possible, to make your way to one of the microphones. If you can't, if you could state your question very, very clearly. Uh, I'd also like to ask you to identify yourselves and keep your question or comment to a minute, if at all possible, and one per person, please. Thank you. Laura. Yes, I'm Laura Peck. I am a fellow in the Masters of Political Management program, but I have been a practitioner of teaching politicians how to get elected and stay elected since 1984. Trump breaks every rule. Uh, so I wonder if I could get you to comment on his communication style. Everything that he does, I would never, uh, I would never counsel a politician to do that. Uh, I wonder if I could uh, get you to, to share with us some of your insights. Okay. So, um, as I said in my remarks, there are a million theories about how Trump got elected, and they're all right to a certain extent. And so, uh, I'll have, I have a few thoughts on this, but I do want to steer people away from the notion that if you know it's, it was this or that was the other. But I'll say a few things because a lot of people said the same thing. This guy is, you know, like uh, the way he speaks, the things he says, his, you know, his the lack of his grasp of the facts, and so on, would have been toxic to anybody else. So I'd say a couple of things. First of all, his use of social media is really quite brilliant. And the way he talks, it sounds like a guy that, you know, the, the, he sounds kind of the way that your sort of like annoying uncle might talk at the barbecue. <laughs> but to a lot of American people, that is, comes across as genuine. And one thing we know about voters in every country is, is that insincerity really is a killer. And Trump, no matter what you think of his views or his intellect, comes across as really believing the things he says, even if what he says today is the opposite of what he said yesterday. So there, and in Hillary Clinton, you know, you had the exact diametric opposite. To the extent that there was a portion of the people that were voting based on style, you know, Trump brought a difference in style that was really quite powerful. Um, also, the, um, the Hillary Clinton campaign was seriously disrupted by their excess of faith in statistics and data. Now, yesterday I was talking to the economics alumni about how great economics is because we all believe in data and so forth, but there's a real risk in believing in it too much. And the Hillary Clinton campaign, I think, will be, you know, um, exhibit A from now on about believing in too much in data. They had stopped polling in Wisconsin something like eight weeks before the election and did not know that this movement was going on. Then there was a whole issue of the hidden Trump vote, right? People didn't want to tell pollsters what they thought you know, because they had been told over and over by the uh, media that this, this was not correct. So I think those are a few of the, a few of the things. But even while I think that these things were valuable, um, let's keep a few bigger points uh, in mind. First of all, Trump lost the popular vote by two percentage points, which was not that far off from the polls. All of the structural factors were going in the Republicans' favor. There was the eight-year itch, you know, the presidential cycle. Uh, th that thing, the fact that economic growth had been slow, these were sort of like structural background factors that should have supported um, the Republican candidate. So um, 
And remember, he only, I can't remember the number, but he got only about a third of the Republican vote during the primary. So as a rough approximation, at least half the people who voted for him would have probably preferred somebody else be the Republican candidate, but he was a Republican candidate they got. So I guess my bottom line is there are many reasons, and I don't want to overstate them, but on the point of communication, the things I said were what I sort of drew away from that. My name is Edward Atraji. I'm an aerospace engineer. I tend to look at things from a higher altitude, if you like. I think on policy, Trump is right on the mark. Uh, but ju I'll just take one uh, matter that you raised about uh, xenophobia. Trump is not against all immigrants. He's only against immigrants from radical Muslim countries. Let's be clear about that. Now, the American psyche is rooted in the soil of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Islam, on the other hand, is a monotheistic religion characterized by submission, which is a very big word, submission to Allah, an unknown quantity, and to Muhammad, who is his chief and last prophet. Can you find anything more diametrically opposite to the, way, uh, the American way of life? There's no such thing. Muslims can never become citizens of a country. Their allegiance is to Allah and to Muhammad. Let's be clear about that. And the only reason why Britain left Europe is because of the Muslim immigration into, into Britain. They okay. have, a, have a big problem okay, here. Okay, I'm going to stop you there, yeah. okay? So could you please, could you please uh, let me know why you think that Trump is such a xenophobe? Uh, sorry. If I, first of all, I think I said in my remarks that uh, I was not making a, expressing a view about whether he was a xenophobe, but I think that it is a factual matter that many people who are xenophobic are very attracted to him. Um, but uh, I, <laughs> with respect, I, I disagree with almost everything you said with respect to Muslims. Um, the, the, um, there are polls, uh, for example, of Muslim attitudes in the United States, and they show that on questions of American values, they are almost indistinguishable from all other Americans. But there are interesting differences between how Muslims in the United States have integrated versus how they've integrated in Britain and in France. And that may have to do with specific institutional obstacles in those countries that do get in the way of the integration of, of Muslims into the broader society. And I'd say one of the foundational issues of the United States, which makes me long-term optimistic, is precisely, as you were saying, it's a country, it was the first country founded on not on soil or blood, but on, on values of life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness, and a lot of other things. And the United States has been through these periods in the past. It was, went through this period, and the, there was a massive uh, period of uh, new immigration in the 1890s through the 1920s. Many of the things that are said about Latino or, or Middle Eastern immigrants today were said about Southern European or Eastern immigrants back then. It created a lot of pressure. It created a backlash, and immigration was basically shut down. And here we are, and you know, those people are as integrated and as indistinguishable from all other Americans, as far as I can tell, as uh, you, know, you, get, you get my point. So I guess what I'm trying to say is that we are dealing with uh, a lot of the pressures that we are seeing in the United States now, in some sense, may, uh, it should not surprise if you look at how the foreign-born population has expanded so rapidly in the last 10 or 15 years. And so, um, but, I am also optimistic from history, not just in the United States, but in this country, that those things do get better with time. The second generation you know, uh, integrates super fast relative to the, uh, sorry, the first generation integrates extremely quickly, the second generation faster so. So most of the problems I think that we're dealing with will be solved by time. Hello, uh, my name is uh, Aiden, and I'm a first year political science student here at Carleton. Uh, and I was uh, wondering, you attributed a lot of the resurgent nationalism to economic reasons. Uh, you did state that there were a non-economic uh, undercurrent, and that's what my question kind of is trying to address. Uh, is there not a case to be made that a lot of the very divisive rhetoric and the polarization that's happening right now in the United States and elsewhere is because we've lost a sense of national homogeny? which kind of led to a sense of uh, solidarity within the nation and strength in the center for free and open debate so that candidates wouldn't have to be pushed to such extremes in order to push policy. 
I mean, that's a great question, and I'd be kidding you if I thought I had, you know, a single answer that can explain all these things. I don't know whether it's the slack of, it's the loss of national, uh, unified national purpose that caused the polarization, or the polarization that caused the lack of, you know, sense of national purpose. Um, I guess I would throw a few things uh, into the pot to sort of like help explain the, the polarization there. Uh, and to anybody who studied American politics, a lot of these will not be surprising. First of all, there's the gerrymandering. I mean, having spent like 15 or 20 years watching the American system close up, it really is phenomenal the extent to which uh, the, the machinery of government can be twisted to partisan purposes. And the gerrymandering, of course, means that you have more and more congressmen running in safe seats where they really don't worry about losing to the Republican or the Democrat in the general election. They worry about losing to the more extreme partisan in the mm -hmm. Uh, in the in the primary, and that was a phenomenon that was first seen with the Republican Party, and frankly, we are now seeing it increasingly with the Democratic Party, where it's getting very difficult for Democrats to take sort of centrist positions, you know, in the face. So that's so that's number one. Um, number two is I don't think I can let my industry off the hook, media. You know what I mean? And this originates in technology, starting with cable television, 500 channels, and so forth. Like in the old days when all you had in the United States was CBS, NBC, and ABC, it was the economic interest of those um, networks to basically aim at the middle because they wanted to get all the people that they could. But with uh, cable television, it became possible to target people. And we know from a variety of research that people really do gravitate to news that they tend to already agree with. It's sad, but true. And now in the days of social media, you know, where Facebook can write algorithms that are customized to each individual user to reinforce the things that they all want to believe, I think it gets worse and worse. And so um, in some sense, this is a time when we need uh, the work of economists and journalists more than ever, but is a time when people are less receptive to what we do than ever. Thanks. Yes. Uh, yeah, hi there. Uh, my name is Sanjay. I'm, uh, I'm an economist at the Bank of Canada. Uh, what I wanted to ask you was, uh, it's no secret that US society is a polarized one, and I mean that would be an understatement. But it does not seem like the election of Trump has uh, you know, you have that enemy and everyone can focus and reconcile their differences to tackle that one enemy. The Republican Party is in, it, it's in shatters. Uh, Trump is a Republican only in the name. And it doesn't seem like the Democrats have reconciled their differences. I mean, just recently Bernie Sanders introduced uh, a bill uh, in trying to introduce a single payer system which has practically no chance of making it through in the Congress and yet there's a wing within the Democrat Party that is still centrist. So it seems like there's a fair bit of tussle going on there as well. Do you foresee a split where we, have, we conventionally move on from a two-party system in the US electoral system? Uh, so I read a terrific essay that I think everybody's interested in American politics should Google. It was by James uh, Fallows in The Atlantic. And he had just come back from China in, uh, and um, he had been there for like 10 or 15 years. And he said, everybody around here thinks America is going to hell. You know, I mean, they're just so miserable. And he just thought America was so wonderful after 10 years in China. And he said, like, <laughs> all his life, he said, and he said, you know, all my life America's been going to hell. There's always been a time when everybody was convinced this country was just finished. And he said, and if you go, go back in history, it, it's true. You know, every American president thought this country, everybody thought, that the other, when somebody became president, the country's going to hell. He said, John Adams uh, thought the country was, you know, sort of Thomas Jefferson thought the country was going to hell when John Adams was president. And John Adams definitely thought the country was going to hell when Thomas Jefferson was president. So there's a degree of like, um, you know, uh, uh, sort of like gloominess and, and uh, sort of like hair on fire to the American political system, which is actually is a self-correcting thing because they, they tried to make it better. You know, the Republican Party was born out of the most divisive split in its history. You know, the, the, when, it's, when the Whig Party basically, you know, fell apart over the issue of slavery, the Republican Party emerged from the ashes and became the, the party of abolition. I don't think that'll happen right now. You see, um, the, there are structures in place that make it very difficult for any party to win an election outside the two major parties. No third party uh, candidacy has come even close. Uh, so I think there are powerful reasons that will drive both parties, um, that will keep them both co uh, cohesive. But I do want to uh, share one thought with you, which is about, um, you said the United States is more divided than ever. I just explained why that sort of comes and goes. One of the things that gives me sort of some comfort is that in the United, not just in the United States, but most countries, one of the striking things about populism is that it's actually not very popular. 
it's actually really rare for a populist candidate to win a majority of the vote. I mean, as I was saying, Marine Le Pen's at 31%, can't seem to get any higher. The one party that really tried to uh, uh, build its identity in Great Britain around throwing the immigrants out, the United Kingdom Independence Party, essentially disintegrated after what they got, <laughs> after they got what they wanted. And even, as I said, in Germany, the, the, um, the German Nationalist Party had gotten as high as 15% in the polls, and now it's down to like seven or eight. What happened? Well, the events that led to the alarm that created the AFD, the influx of all these refugees, they ended. So similarly, one of the, you know, um, uh, uh, sui generis factors that probably helped Trump was that there were two very serious uh, Islamic ISIS inspired terrorist attacks in the United States, the one in San Bernardino and the one in Orlando, Florida. And so those things do have a tendency to drive particular um, political movements for a time. But unless you expect that those to be a permanent feature of the landscape, they eventually lose their potency and we go back to caring about the things that we used to care. So that gives me some optimism that um, the political machinery will eventually absorb, co-op, move past some of these specific issues. Uh, and that the polarization that you see today will not be as extreme. It will go back to essential, it's, uh, I mean, we are in a period of extreme dysfunction and polarization right now. My hope is that before long, we will go back to just a normal level of polarization and dysfunction. <laughs> I love those historical references, Greg. Matt. Uh, my name is Matt Peltier. I'm a fourth year student at Arthur Kroger College. Um, my question sort of revolves around the topic of, um, I guess it's called civic nationalism, sort of movements that brand themselves as nationalists but are, in a sense, complementary to the ideals of, I guess, economic liberalism. So the case is, I guess, um, the Scottish National Party, which, although it's at its root a nationalist movement, it's in favor of uh, integrating further with uh, the European Union and was very much opposed, uh, as the Brexit referendum showed, very much opposed to uh, leaving the Union. Um, what sort of future do civic nationalist movements have uh, what, uh, in terms of um, their survival and their sustainability when compared to the um, sort of the more harder nationalist movements that we're concerned about right now? So I wasn't aware of that term, uh, and I don't, I, mean, I can't, uh, admit that I've thought about it a lot, but I do. You do bring up something which I think is quite interesting. So in my remarks, I mentioned how uh, over the last 400 years, most statesmen would have been shocked to hear nationalism described as a bad thing, because for a lot of countries that are with us today, a sense of nationalism was in fact, you know, the juice that got them independence and so on. And in many nationalist movements, from Scotland to Quebec, as you described, see their sort of founding principles of the nation they want to create as also embracing those open and liberal values that we talked about. Which is why I think it's important to say that nationalism is not intrinsically in attention with or at odds with some of the, those things that we care about. If you look at, um, but uh, if you look at Israel, for example, I mean, Israel was founded on a, on a, a complete like nationalist theory, but they've tried to put in place all its existence, all the sort of the, the principles of liberalism that, uh, that you see in all these Western democracies. They too face tensions because, you know, the non-Jewish, the Arab population is growing faster than the Jewish population there. But I think that, um, I'm glad you brought that up because I do think it shows that there is a constructive, or not even the word constructive, but there is a neutral role for nationalism and it doesn't need to be a regressive force. And that in some sense, um, once, if I'm right, that eventually the, the intrinsic um, merit of the globalized system shows itself through. And if the advocates and the defenders of that system recognize where they've overreached, recognize where they have pushed populations further than they want to go and correct accordingly, then um, some of the nationalist backlash that we see today will recede. But in that environment, there will still be the more, as you call them, the civic nationalist movements that there have always been. You know what I mean? Perhaps the Catalans will one day get independence. Perhaps the Scots will one day get independence. Perhaps one day the Isle of Man will have that referendum and secede from the United Kingdom. <laughs> uh, hi, my name is Nicholas. I'm an MA in uh, political economy. Uh, first of all, just thank you very much. I thought uh, your sober analysis is very refreshing. Yeah, thank you. Um, I guess my question is, there's a, there's a sense amongst certain political economists of the left, uh, Wolfgang Streeck um, and those kinds of guys, that um, globalism is somehow antithetical to the modern nation state and, and its, its sovereignty. 
Um, so I guess, do you see any correlation or any truth to that, that it would somehow affect the democratic process and make states more vulnerable to the kind of wave of populism that we've been seeing? Um, I agree with that more than you might think. I, I actually absolutely do believe that there is a fundamental tension between nationalism and globalism, and that is why we are in this moment today. And I think the most obvious example would be the European Union, where they decided the European Union, right from the signing of the Treaty of Rome in 1957, it's right in the charter, This, the end goal is political union. And so with each passing year, European Union, the European Union has defined success as, as shunting more and more sovereignty up to the European level. And so even before immigration became the hot button issue that it is in, the, in, in Britain, the sort of like the sense that the European Commission was a bunch of, you know, you know, interfering technocratic, like, you know, European, you know, French speaking <laughs> annoyances <laughs> had become a major burden, you know? I mean, that is why Euroscepticism had, what it, uh, had such a uh, strong following within the Conservative Party, even before immigration uh, became the issue that it was. And I do believe that sometimes globalist movements do begin to uh, allow the aim of more supranational sovereignty to become the ends rather than the means. You know, frankly, the World Trade Organization has features of that. And I think that it needs to revisit how it goes about some of the things. And certainly, the European Union needs to revisit those. And by the way, um, a lot of people in the European Union, including Donald Tusk, as current president, say the same thing. Hi there, my name's Meredith Lilly. I'm a professor here at Carleton. I teach international trade, including a course on NAFTA. Um, I'm frequently asked to comment in the media about uh, the state of kind of kind of US um, trade relations because of that, also because of previous experience that I had negotiating trade agreements on behalf of Canada. Um, and uh, I try to make myself available to the media, um, but I find increasingly that I feel like I'm kind of part of a charade. In, and, and what I mean by that is, is that I think initially, after Donald Trump was elected, I felt some patriotic duty to um, kind of push back against some of the, the misinformation. Um, and I think that I saw, and, and I know that I read quite a bit of discussion about this in the US media, that the US media also kind of wanted to figure out a way to um, call fake news what it was when it was. Um, but I think over time, I've, I feel like, the media is now playing the game that, that the president would like them to play. And, and by that, I mean, you know, you, you mentioned the withdrawal of chorus. From the moment that I heard, that I read the first tweet that suggested this might be possible, I said, oh, he's not going to do that. And so what's going to happen is he's going to do exactly what he did with NAFTA, is he's going to threaten to do this, he's going to get the headlines. After kind of people stop writing about this, he's going to change direction, and he's not, he's not going to proceed, and everything will go back the way it was. And so far, that's exactly what's happened. And so yesterday's news was Wilbur Ross, five-year sunset clause on NAFTA, also something that's just a non-starter. Um, and so I guess my question to you is, is do you think it's, it's a fair observation that that the media now seems to be accepting these headlines as if kind of quite uncritically and, oh, expert, would you please talk about this headline as if it's real, when in fact I think um, perhaps these are negotiating positions that are being taken by the administration. And so I just kind of wonder about your, your views on, on the media, Trump, and, and the um, uh, accepting headlines for, for being actual news. So I guess I would hope that one of the things you would say on those interviews is I believe this to be just a negotiating position. And you could say that like if you've ever been part of any bargaining, whether it's like you were buying a house, you know, or trying to decide with your spouse where to go on vacation, you ask for this. <laughs> you ask for the moon, you settle for the topsoil. You know what I mean? This like this is a negotiation. And Trump himself admits this. I mean, he was the first guy in the history of presidential campaigns that I follow who put out a tax plan immediately said he didn't plan to actually stick to it. It was just a starting place, okay? So that, I think just bringing that point of view as a negotiator, never mind an economist, but as a negotiator is a very valuable thing and I would hope that my peers here in Canada will come to you and ask you and, and actually use that quote on the air in their article to point that fact out. Now, the broader picture of what is the media's role in the, in the age of Trump. So I think there's sort of like two, two, two risks. One is that you take what he says or implies and you run with it. You know, you in some sense take them, uh, as the saying goes, you take them literally but not seriously. 
And I think that there, I can't really think of a way around that. When the President of the United States says, I'm going to pull us out of Korea, the chorus, you kind of have to report that, right? And we don't know what's going on in his head or what he's thinking. He might do it. So, and honestly, Korea, pulling out of Korea sells more headlines than, you know, mentions he might pull out of Korea, but don't, don't ignore, don't pay attention, right? So I'm going to sort of like, I'm not, just, well, I guess I am defending it, but we're going to keep doing that, okay? And we're going to keep doing that when Chelsea Clinton is president and so on. So <laughs> that part's not going to change. There's a somewhat different picture, which is that because so many things that Trump has done or proposed are so unusual and so outside the, you know, the guardrails of what we are used to seeing in the United States, that there are some media organizations and some journalists who are inclined to be skeptical or critical of virtually everything he says. And they almost take the attitude that because Trump is for it, it can't be right. And so there is a, a tendency to search every little piece of what he does or said and sort of like then either say it's wrong or go and find, hopefully find you to say that it's wrong. And um, I always say it's wrong. No, okay. <laughs> but you might find in your interview that you say he's right about this and wrong about that, that but the only part they put on the air is the wrong about that part. I, I don't want to presume that's what's going on, but uh, I, I, I can imagine that that happens. And I think the problem with that is, is uh, well, it's pretty obvious, is that you're doing a disservice in some sense to Trump, but you're doing a disservice to your readers in the sense that you're not actually telling them what's really going on. I, I mean, I'll give you an example. Um, one of the things that the American negotiators are very unhappy about is the rules of origin in, in NAFTA, okay? They say the rules of origin are written in such a way that it, as long as... Um, uh, a, a certain, I can't remember what percentage of a content of a car is North, is North American, it can move, okay, can move <laughs> duty free, right? Well, um, the, when Mexico then moves a car, uh, a ton of their content may have actually come from China, first of all, right? And so it ends up that, you know, is that like Germany will um, put, uh, uh, will assemble cars in Mexico where 40% of the value is, came from China or Germany, something like that, and then moves through the rest of the country. And they don't think that's the way it should have been. And they want to actually rewrite the rules and say this should be an American amount. Well, at first, because I kind of thought NAFTA was a good thing, I was dismissive. But the more I thought about that, you know, he's, he's kind of got a point there, right? <laughs> he's kind of got a point there. And um, I'll give you another example. A uh, the, the lot of the media were pointing out how few laws Trump has passed. And Trump was, in some sense, just bringing it on himself because he would boast about how his was the most productive presidency in history that accomplished more than any other president could possibly have. That F FDR was such a piker. Um, <laughs> and so media would point out, look, no important laws passed except they renamed a post office, like in Nashville or something like that. And I said, well, OK, so I'm going to point out that this is just not true. Trump has done a crap load of stuff, OK? And the reason you're not aware of that is because he appointed tons of people to places like the Security and Exchange Commission, the Office of the Controller of the Currency, the Food and Drug Administration, agencies that you can't even pronounce, much less understand what they do. And they are taking decisions with extraordinary importance on the economy and on your ordinary lives with no oversight and no recourse to Congress. This is actually kind of the logical conclusion of what I call the imperial presidency of the United States. Presidents can accomplish a lot without um, a Congress. And I am proud to say that that is a point of view that is becoming more widespread. People are waking up to the fact that there are people appointed by Trump that are doing really consequential things below the radar. But those who are getting their news from organizations that were dwelling ad nauseum on the absence of legislation would have been misled into thinking that nothing important is going on. So I would give you that example. Um, let me first thank you for the presentation. I'm not an economist, so forgive me if I, uh, God bless you. If I take it. <laughs> I'll take this in a different uh, direction, but I very much appre appreciated the perspective that you're looking at things from. I wondered why you did, like you talked about global, globalism uh, versus nationalism and republics and Democrats and so on, but you didn't get into the religion aspect of it. And obviously for us in Canada, religion is, is not really a factor in politics, but it is in the United States. It's a huge factor and the role that the Christian right did in the election of Trump is, is not trivial. And very recently when you saw them praying over him uh, in, that, in that famous scene with all the heads of churches around praying over him, and I know from friends in the United States when he was elected, the, the Facebook logo was Jesus is now in the, is in the White House. Uh, and the reason I'm interested in, in this perspective of the religion is that I personally am a Canadian citizen who happens to be a Muslim and who happens to be following in the, in the Muslim countries 
the rise of the people there against mixing religion with politics, which, yes. which was quite obviously a bit of a mess. People tried it, and they saw that Islamism, from that perspective, did not bring in the justice that they were looking for, and it just brought in horrible, horrible things. So there is a massive uh, pushback against mixing religion and politics in the Muslim world, which in the Arab Muslim world, which may or may not be making it to the uh, uh, world news over here. But as a person who knows what's happening over there, when I watch the US, I literally have a one-to-one -one correspondence. I will give you, I'm an engineer too, I'll give you an Excel sheet and I will put on the left what, what the Islamists do, did in the Arab world, and then I will put to you what, what Trump is doing. It's one-to-one -one correspondence. And, and people know Mike Pence's uh, background and position. So the question is, did you look at it from a religion perspective of the rise of the Christian right, uh, extremist Christian right, that very much corresponds to the extremist, any, any religion, and what role that plays in the politics of the United States now? Okay. Uh, it's not my area of expertise. I would say that I do not believe that the even the most extreme Christian right, or the, I, you, you cannot, I, I think to, to uh, compare the uh, Christian right in the United States with some of these theocratic regimes is a category error. There's just no comparison. You know, I mean, the United States Constitution is extremely strong on this point. Uh, and I think that you would, first of all, the influence of the Christian right in the United States is not a new thing. It's been there for quite a few decades. So I don't think it has played a unique role in Trump's presidency. Um, and the rise of the Christian right, in some sense, was a reaction to what they saw as this, the unnecessary uh, desecularization of American life by unelected judges. Now, I want to sort of like separate the question of whether these, who's right or wrong about these things, whether there should be freedom of abortion or not. These are difficult questions, not my place tonight to sort of say yes or no to these things. But it is a true statement that a lot of those questions were not decided in legislatures or referendums or elections, but they were decided by judges. And at some point, those who felt very strongly about those issues realized that if they wanted those issues to be decided in the way they would prefer, they would have to be the ones who appoint the judges. And so you see in the United States, the judicial nomination process in particular for the Supreme Court of the United States has become this gigantic wedge issue that is so important. And that's one of the things that has got, that makes the Christian right a cohesive and motivated group of people. And I've heard it said, and I think it's an underappreciated fact, that Mitch McConnell, who's the leader of the Republican majority in the Senate, essentially delivered the presidency to Donald Trump. And how did he do that? Because a year before the election, Anto uh, Antony Scalia died. And so there's a vacancy on the Supreme Court. And Barack Obama nominated a very capable jurist um, named Merrick Garland. And uh, McConnell refused to have a hearing, basically said, we're going to leave that seat open until another president is elected. And as a result, the Christian right, which might have sat on the sidelines because Trump was not a kind of candidate that they naturally had any affinity for, felt they had to go out and vote. Because if they didn't vote for Trump, then Hillary Clinton would win, and they would not like the person she appointed to the Supreme Court. So these are the subtleties you have to understand there. So I, um, I understand what you're saying, and I do think that there are some regrettable aspects. But it is a category error to compare the role of the Christian right in the United States with some of the theocratic regimes in the Muslim world that I think you're ref referring to. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And thank you, Greg, for wonderful. Last night, as Greg explained, was uh, this, this week is throwback uh, here at Carleton, where a number of events to bring alumni back to campus. And so last night was uh, the economics uh, event, and Greg uh, uh, presented or gave, gave, this, gave a speech uh, uh, to, to a bunch of economists. And one of the things he said was that what economists should try to do, one thing economists should try to do is, is kind of, and I, I, it's not what you said, but you'll get the point, is kind of to talk economics to non-economists in the way that they'll ca actually understand. So that there is amongst economists this tribal language that for people who don't know or like economics sounds really bizarre. But there are some useful tidbits in there. Uh, and so you have to find a way of getting the useful tidbits out. Well, we've got a lot of tidbits tonight in a way that actually was accessible, as Barry has said, to broad. So you didn't realize that you got a lot of economics tonight. And it's a credit to Greg for having been able to do this. So thank you very much.
So over the last uh, two years uh, at the, in the Faculty of Public Affairs, we've had a project called 75 for the 75th. So it really started about a year, uh, you know, 15 months uh, uh, from, uh, from last June to highlight 75 prominent alumni from programs of study offered by units in the Faculty of Public Affairs. We delivered the, developed a list in consultation with chairs and directors of units in the faculty. And tonight was the big party. We invited many of the 75, as all of the 75, to come and join us uh, for dinner in, immediately prior to the lecture. Greg, of course, was one of the 75. So many of them are, in, are, are here. Uh, it was wonderful to have you back on campus. So again, thank you to all of the 75 uh, who, who joined us uh, this evening. One thing I'd like to mention is that the Faculty of Public Affairs runs a number of events over the course of the year. And we have a, 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 something called a, a book club without the guilt. It's called, uh, it's called author, so you don't have to read the book, it's the punchline. So it's called Author Meets Readers. So it is uh, the author being a faculty member in the Faculty of Public Affairs, who, and then we have an event to where they talk about the book. We get other people who have read the book to come and tell you about the book. And so it's, uh, it's at Irene's Pub in the Glebe. You get the point. Uh, and it starts, our first is on September 28th. It usually starts at 5.30. Please feel free to join, it, join us. It's a great evening and we buy snacks. So just in case you're like a lot of people around here respond to snacks. So thank you again to all of you for coming tonight. Thank you to Greg for a wonderful presentation. And as Barry mentioned, there is a reception right outside in the hall. Please join us. Thanks. Good night.